See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. As a society, we don't preventively look at function. It's true that in regular medical care, nobody asks, can you get your foot over into the bathtub or can you walk to the mailbox and back? But these are the things that anyone cares about, older adults and you and me and anybody else is, can you do what you want to be able to do? Yet we don't actually measure that or intervene on it in general. It's almost as though we think when someone's got some difficulties or disability with their daily activities, it's too late. We developed Capable, showing that a lot of disability is modifiable. In fact, we cut disability in half. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Wow. Cutting disability in half? Increasing ability by 50%. That's remarkable. But what does that actually mean? What does that look and feel like? And how is it happening? For many older adults, healthy aging means more than just managing and preventing disease and chronic conditions. It also means continuing to live a productive, meaningful life by having the option to stay in one's home, remain engaged in the community, and maintain social well-being, aging how and where we want. And every eight seconds, another American is celebrating their 65th birthday. That's 10,000 newly eligible Medicare beneficiaries every day. According to many U.S. surveys and sources, it's not surprising that almost all older adults want to remain in their homes instead of going into an assisted living or residential facility. But how many older Americans can do so safely? Every May, the Administration for Community Living leads the nation's observance of Older Americans Month. The 2023 theme is Aging Unbound, which offers an opportunity to explore diverse aging experiences and discuss how communities can support them. That's the theme of the episode you're about to hear. It sparks flexible and fresh thinking about aging and reminds us how we all benefit when older adults are engaged, independent, and included. Enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Sarah Zanton. I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. Along with others, I've developed the Capable program, which we have tested and scaled and also do work on other areas of health disparity among older adults, such as financial strain and structural racial discrimination and resilience. Tell me about Laura Gitlin and her <laughs> initial program with ABLE, right? Yes, yeah. ABLE program. So right. you've been building off of that. Right, exactly. When I started to want to think about these issues based on my house calls experience with older adults where they were so limited from environments that were clearly modifiable, I started to kind of shop around my ideas and found the work of Laura Gitlin, who has been just completely transforming for me as a mentor and an intellectual guide. And she had developed the ABLE program that you just mentioned, the Capables Adapted From. And the ABLE program was really the platform for everything about Capable. It had the occupational therapist and home modification and the idea of brainstorming and action planning and, and helping build people's self-efficacy. And what we added to it was the nursing component and the home repair aspects and so it's been a you know a kind of a wonderful partnership together over the last 12 13 years. One of the things that really strikes me is so much of what we talk about in healthcare is so big, so monumental, so massive because we're talking about it in terms of huge populations. But in the conversations and the stories and the work that you're doing, it comes down to the things that really matter and they're small the small wins, the quick mm -hmm. wins. Mm -hmm. Can I get my foot in the bathtub? Right. Still from this very big research base where we're talking about 10,000 
people turning 65 every day. We're talking about billions of dollars being spent, but the work that you're doing and the way you present it, it just zooms in on having small wins and creating value and them being human centered. I think you still get really excited about these important, but what might sound like really small wins. Oh, absolutely. So May will be the month honoring older adults and the theme for 2021, Communities of Strength. And the opening statement to celebrating this year is older adults have built resilience and strength over their lives through successes, failures, joys, and difficulties. Their stories and contributions help to support and inspire others. This year, we celebrate the strength of older adults and the aging network with a special emphasis on the power of connection and engagement in building strong communities. In talking about aging, aging with dignity, older adults, you speak with such respect and reverence and joy about their level of fascination, the wisdom, the ability to continue to make contributions and to grow right up until the last weeks before death occurs. What was that experience that gave you some insights on where your career was going to go? Yeah. Thank you, Shauna. So when I was in high school, my senior year of high school, I did an internship at a place for adolescents who were troubled in various ways. And I took a bus leaving from there to go back to school every day. This wasn't too long after the riots and uprisings in the late sixties and Washington DC, where I grew up was a really segregated place in terms of opportunities and all kinds of other ways of segregation. And I have a fantastic family of origin, but one of the tropes had been that there's good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods, or that's a bad neighborhood. But going through these neighborhoods, and I would see people waiting for the bus and getting on and going on to jobs or see older adults sweeping the stoops or see these communities of connection that really differed in terms of the resources, the, the financial resources, but not in terms of the human resources, really got me to thinking in a structural way about who gets what and why are people in certain neighborhoods and there aren't actually bad neighborhoods. <laughs> there's <laughs> people everywhere. <laughs> And there's neighborhoods with fewer resources. And why is that? And so when I got to college, I majored in African-American studies, which is interdisciplinary, which I think also has been really key to my work because I really liked seeing how ideas connect across boundaries. And so in African-American studies, we would have a topic every week, like let's say housing and would read a novel where housing was kind of a main factor and study the history of funding for public housing and learn about the effect of lead and public housing on children. And so each week would be a different topic in understanding across disciplines, which I really, you know, at the time, I think majoring in African-American studies was just purely out of interest, but it's really served me well in my intellectual career as well. In that experience, extrapolating that out now, and you said that it's really helping you to guide your work or have insights into it. Mm -hmm. In what ways are you seeing that influencing or informing your work? So I think partly being transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and thinking across disciplines has been handy in terms of where I can find colleagues and ideas And then also that no one discipline has the solution for society's ills and that it takes a lot of different thought leaders and implementations and research to come to solutions. And then also the lesson of kind of reading a novel about anything that you're thinking about, a lot of research about fiction, improving people's empathy. And I think empathy is at the root of trying to solve and work on human problems with the idea that we all deserve the same amount of dignity and and opportunity. And that when you have been in someone's head through fiction, that that becomes more real. So in your early years academically, I don't think that you had in mind where you would be spending most of your professional career with this appreciation, admiration, and I think cherishing older adults. What are some of the experiences that really helped you to have an understanding of disparities, differences that that led you to wanting to support older adults and the care Mm -hmm. that they get? 
my grandmother lived with us growing up and she was wonderful, but I had a kind of overwhelming caregiving situation as an adolescent. And so if anything, I was kind of shying away from older adults. In fact, I almost really kind of covered my ears practically during nursing school and nurse practitioner school when learning about older adults thinking, well, I work with homeless adults and I'm I'm not going to need this knowledge. I mean, I, I hate to admit that, but that was kind of how I felt at the time. And, and now there are sadly many older adults who are homeless or near homeless or crowded up with others. But at the time, there really weren't as many. But my first job after nursing school was with migrant farm workers who often lived in kind of repurposed chicken coops. And then my next job was with working with adults experiencing homelessness. So that was out in shelters and and sometimes the clinic and on the street. And then my next job after that was providing primary care to homebound older adults as a nurse practitioner. And I went into that not being sure I wanted to work with older adults, but really just, I mean, more from a social justice perspective, the idea that these people had worked hard their whole lives Mm -hmm. and were just as valuable as anybody should be and should have as much dignity as anybody, but they're so under-resourced and forgotten in a lot of ways. And, and so, so many people who were home alone all day, I'm thinking of one person who was bed bound and of her adult children, the quote unquote successful ones had moved out and had jobs and were working them and would check on her. And she had one son who experienced mental illness and they lived together. So she was bed bound and he would take care of her physically. And when he would leave for his mental daycare during the day, he would make her a big smoothie and leave it right next to her on her bedside table so that she wouldn't be hungry during the day. And they really propped each other up. That was a real lesson to me in how much resilience there is. And so there was just kind of this feeling that arose in me, not that I was particularly interested in older adults, more just that I was interested in in humans having a, a fair shot. And I also it was really struck by the structural differences. So for example, had people who what they had done for their jobs had been some form of cleaning, like a a house cleaner for a family or a janitor for a school. And they had such different retirement differences because one had been unionized and one hadn't, right? So if you've worked for a school system, you have the Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance and you have a pension. And if you've been a house cleaner, you've got nothing because the family doesn't owe you anything. And so people who had been house cleaners for a family who were living on $400 a month, social security, for example. And that's even given that they had essentially the same occupation. So always taking in mind that the structural differences in terms of both opportunities and, and benefits as well. Structural opportunities, that story that you just shared is emblematic of what we see. And that's just one example of a structural differentiator, Mm -hmm. um, a a structure in place that's going to create a disparity and inequity. And these are long-term, long-standing with enormous differences between outcomes. What are you seeing? What do you think? What do we need to know? (laughs) That's a big, big question. So just to take it to the most basic level, everyone in this country would likely agree that we are all created in ways that we we should be equal and we should have equal opportunities to have a full human life with dignity. And the end results aren't usually that people have had all the same opportunity. And that starts from prenatal care on up, that starts from housing, the amount of green space around, the job opportunities over and over at each stage of life, there are real structural differences. It's not just how hard you work or who you know. One of the great tools of research is to design experiments and interventions and programs to try to either highlight that or make changes or make policymakers see the differences that could happen if different policies change. And I guess if I could just add something also the the difference between equality and equity, I think is an important thing. A lot of people think, well, just give everyone the same opportunity and then it should all work out. But there's so many structural barriers between the opportunity and it working out. And I think as a good example of that is 
if you just put online that people can get vaccinations for COVID and say, we're just making it equal for everyone. But if you look at that, right, who doesn't have access to the internet, either from like a perspective of the resource, or they don't know how to use it, and who doesn't have a car to get to a stadium that's in a suburban place, and and who doesn't have someone who can help them get access to the internet. And so an equity perspective would look at who has gotten vaccinated of the people who want to, not what have we done to just open it up to everyone? And, and there's a real difference there. And, and an equity perspective would have us going door to door and asking, would you like me to help you sign up? And here's a shot rather than just saying, well, we put it online. You've hit on an example that makes it really easy for people to understand the difference between equality and equity. And one of the questions that I like to ask is how easy was it for you to actually get your vaccine? It's available to everybody, but what barriers, what hoops did you need to right. go through? aging, growing older. We have a demographic across the globe where we have an aging population everywhere and health Mm -hmm. systems everywhere are struggling against a couple of competing demands, a growing cohort of people who are elderly and needing care, Mm -hmm. a workforce that is shrinking and Mm -hmm. overwhelmed and health systems who are struggling to figure out how to provide the care, the level of care at an affordable way (laughs) against a backdrop of there are just fewer people to take care of them, whether it's a paid professional or just even in a family member. Right. There's fewer unpaid caregivers too. Yeah. So, so we, I'm, I'm putting that out there from the standpoint of this is a global phenomenon. There's no place that isn't trying to figure this out. Can you give us um, like a state of the older adults uh, reports, you know, that, that union, like, <laughs> how do you describe this population, what they're doing, what their needs are? Right. So there's a lot of questions in that question. I wouldn't just phrase it as a, as a question of, of need. If you think about aging, it can be 35 to 40 years, right? If you think about 65 to hundred and that's a big developmental period. You know, you would never say zero to 35 is one age range, right? And I'm not attacking you. I'm just saying one way, the society wouldn't, or that 35 to 70 is one developmental age. So the, the cutoff at 65 really comes from when the average life expectancy was shorter. I mean, people have always lived to be in their nineties or hundred, but it's been many fewer. And now there's many more people who didn't die of their first heart attack or of their first cancer, which is wonderful. And that's a big success of society and modern medicine. And so, you know, that's, that's a great thing. Then I would also say that within aging, there are so many older adults who are doing wonderfully and making huge contributions to society, right? Huge and small and everything in between. So, I mean, if you look at who runs for president or who are senators, you know, there's a lot of older adults (laughs) in there, whether you want them there or not. Um, And so one of the things is not to think about aging as necessarily monolithic. For example, if we had three different two-year-olds here in this time with us, Even before we met them, we would know they would probably have trouble sitting still. They'd be able to speak some and say some sentences, but not really long sentences. And they might say no a lot, right? That that we just know that about a two-year-old, unless they have some genetic differences. But if you had three 80-year-olds, you know, or if you tried to track them down, you know, 78 years later, one of them might be dead. One of them might have maybe high blood pressure and some arthritis, but they're taking care of their grandchildren and volunteering for their daughter's small business. And one of them might be a marathoner. And so as we- One of them might be your senator. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so as we age, the, the health trajectories and the function trajectories really widen we don't know what an 80 year old looks like. We do have, we have images, we have kind of ageist images of that are always reinforced in media of like a woman with a gray bun at the, the back of her head and hunched over either a cane or a walker. That's just stereotypical. There's so much variation among older adults. So that, I think that's one part of the answer. And then another part is that we are all hardwired to want to, to give back and to want to be useful. And older adults are doing that all the time. And uh, I'm thinking of a a gentleman 
who had capable a few years ago, when we reached out to him because someone wanted to interview him, he was busy helping his grandson do online school because of the pandemic. And this was someone who, before he started capable, he couldn't get off his couch by himself. He hadn't had a bath or a shower in a year and he couldn't prepare foods. And now he can do all those. And he's helping take care of his grandchildren so that his children can work. And so uh, we really have to change the narrative from like aging in community as a good thing, which is good, but it's this passive thing and that you're just kind of biding time in your home and in your community. Slowly deteriorating. Right. To something where they're engaged and they're active and they're, and they're doing things and they have the capability, both physical and mental um, and emotional to be able to do that. Oftentimes when we talk about aging in place, I hear that term used a lot from the standpoint of imagining someone who is, to your point, on this maybe slow decline mentally, emotionally, spiritually, creatively, financially. And the group of older adults that I spend time with, one is a recently published author Mm -hmm. who also paints and is restoring farmhouses. Another is doing a documentary film. She's an ultra marathoner and has done the the desert marathons on on seven different deserts. And I I look at them and I am so inspired. Uh, the, The one, another one who just had a birthday recently, every decade, it's his goal to disrupt himself. And Mm -hmm. what that means is new career, new place to go and live and explore. Doesn't change spouses. Oh, good. (laughs) Isn't disrupting himself that way. And his spouse on board with the changing? Oh, yeah. Both of them have embraced that. Uh So these are also our older adults. And so when we talk about aging and community, I don't think we hear about their works of art, their political activism, and those are also our older adults. Mm -hmm. And I think President Biden is another very important example for us to look at as far as taking on the challenges and the problems of the world on behalf of leading the American people. Yeah. So these are some of the stories that people don't hear. What are the stories that people do hear? the problems that uh, are, are more standard or more typical, what is successful aging? Well, I really dislike the term successful aging because it implies that there's unsuccessful aging and people are failures. And I think it also implies that it's all under someone's control. You know, it's all kind of in their head or in up to how hard they work. So I, I prefer people should be able to age how, how they want and where they want. But to the kind of the earlier part of your question about what do we know and what are we hearing, it is true that physiology changes and biology changes and that there is decrement in various parts of, of an older adult's body. And that, for example, the, the mitochondria and their cells work a little differently and there can be a little less energy. So, but older adults learn to like space out what they're doing and, and take breaks. And there's a lot of wisdom <laughs> for the rest of us, I think. <laughs> um, also, we are such an ableist society where we value like doing and, and being able that we kind of assume people are disabled at a certain point, and then they're not as useful. And to me, we need much more of a spectrum approach where Throughout the life course, there are people with disabilities throughout the whole life course, and that as a society, we need to have there be fewer barriers to participation and more paying attention to what people want to be able to do and what their environment and intrinsically in themselves um, needs to happen to be able to do what they would like to be able to do. And that in aging that gets accentuated, but there's so much preventively we can do about disability. And also once people have disability, there's so much we can do to help them be able to participate in life the way they want to be able to. You speak a lot about the adaptability and wisdom Mm -hmm. that are exhibited in, in older adults. Maybe they're just the natural innovators that we have not been tapping into yes. to, to better understand, A, what the problem is. And clearly they've been experiencing the problem, but to your point, they have a lot of isolation. And so we don't see what those solutions might look like, but see more about your experience and, and how there is this adaptability and wisdom inherently exhibited by our older adults. 
Yeah. So I think you can see it also in how people have reacted to the pandemic that older adults have been doing surprisingly well. I mean, who have not been sick from it, but really our young adult, our adolescents and people in their twenties were seeing much more um, psychological burden. I think for older adults, there's a lot of wisdom gained from having experienced challenges prior. So older adults are, are adapting all the time. They're adapting to physical things like getting shorter and adapting to, you know, maybe a spouse dying or children moving away. And so I think that older adults are constantly adapting and it gets up to the rest of society and maybe family members to help them adapt in constructive ways. I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone climb up on their counter to reach something who's an 80 year old. And, and we say, we, we, we've got to reach her for that. Or, you know, there are other ways to adapt. We'll guide people to keep their heavy items like a big pot if they want to make something on their stove instead of lugging it out from below. So you can teach old people new tricks, especially if it's geared towards something they want to be able to do. You know, I don't really like cooking. If someone's telling me better ways to cook, I might not pay any attention at all. <laughs> so let's talk about the, the capable program. And I want to go into that by talking about physical function. Mm -hmm. I have heard you say and have read many times that physical function is a completely unaddressed a set of needs and circumstances amongst older adults that in all of our medical encounters, no one asks these things. Right. And yet here they are the drivers of health cost. Right. They are the driver of health risk. They are frequently that thing that precipitates somebody to have an injury. Life was good. And then all right. of a sudden they have some type of an injury or an illness where they were high functioning independent in a short period of time that dramatically changes. So maybe you want to start from the physical function aspect and sure. how that has been driving the capable program. Sure. So as a society, we don't preventively look at function or even when there's a little bit of trouble, we tend to focus on it after someone's broken a hip or after they've had a fall or after maybe they've had a knee surgery and, and then they have maybe some home health visits to get them back up to their functional state, but often they don't get to their pre you know, hospitalization function. And it's true that in regular medical care, nobody asks, can you get your foot over into the bathtub or can you walk to the mailbox and back? These are the things that anyone cares about, older adults and you and me and anybody else is, can you do what you want to be able to do? And in fact, that's why we care about health. We're trying to prevent heart attacks and diabetes and everything so that people can do what they want to be able to do. Yet we don't actually measure that or intervene on it in general. It's almost as though we think once someone's got some difficulties or disability with their daily activities, it's too late. We developed Capable, which I'll describe, showing that we, we can modify disability. A lot of disability is modifiable. In fact, we cut it disability in half, and that's really a conservative measure. So Capable is a four-month program. It involves 10 visits with an older adult at their home. They are really in charge. It's based on what they would like to be able to do. And they receive six visits with an occupational therapist and four visits with a nurse and up to about $1,300 of attention to their home based around goals that they come up with with the occupational therapist and the nurse. So for example, they may want to be able to take a bath by themselves without someone having to help them. They may want to be able to prepare dinner themselves. They may want to be able to get out their front door, down their steps, and into their son's car to go somewhere. Those could be three goals. They get six goals total. All the brainstorming and coming up with ideas and also attention to their home is based on those. So for example, a railing on the outside and strength and balance exercises and a special kind of lazy Susan to help you be able to sit down sideways in the car and then get your, your legs in. Everything about what we offer has to do with fundamentally what they want to be able to do. And that's on purpose for several reasons. One is because that's our mission. <laughs> Another is that builds what scientists call self-efficacy, meaning if you can achieve small gains and they're noticeable, then that helps you achieve future gains. So it builds resilience and it builds ability to solve future problems. Yeah. Those things build upon one another. Mm -hmm. 
and capable. I love how in research you guys always come up with an acronym that fits. <laughs> like, I mean, capable, like, of course, the capable program, but people might not know that capable is community, aging in place, advancing, better living for elders. Yeah. How, how nicely did that work out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it's great to see the intervention, and we're seeing that this is making a, a difference in people's lives. Speak first on the qualitative differences. Uh, I love some of the quotes and the the glee that I've heard in the voices mm-hmm. of, of some of your clients, and the surprise, you know, mm-hmm. that they they did not realize that they were able to do some of these things. Mm-hmm. The delight when it does happen. But what are some of the qualitative impacts that were unexpected? A lot of the ones that were unexpected have to do with meaningful activities. We design capable more around people being able to do what gerontologists call activities of daily living, which are the kinds of things that keep you out of a nursing home, like bathing, dressing, grooming, being able to get on and off the toilet yourself, those kinds of things that are basic daily activities that someone can do for you, but it's very uncomfortable to have someone bathe you or wipe you. But a lot of the real joy in what capable participants experience is being able to do that and being able to go somewhere or participate in a community event or be able to garden again, or to be able to listen to the birds on their back stoop themselves. And so those are the things that just feel so exciting. And and of course, it's also so meaningful to be able to be part of a program that helps people do their daily activities. And I'm thinking of a woman who when she got a raised toilet seat um, that the occupational therapist put in. So a toilet is a, it's a very low chair and it's something that has to be used, you know, multiple times a day and with knee pain or leg weakness or with poor balance, it can be really hard to use and falls in the bathroom are often tragic. And so I remember standing at a door waiting for an older adult to come to the door. And I was actually with a visitor. She was someone from the secretary of health's office for the whole state of Maryland. And so I was a little nervous standing there and the older adult comes to the door in tears. And I thought, oh no, what, what has happened? And she was actually crying tears of joy about this raised toilet seat, because she said, I'm not going to have to hold my pee anymore. And I can just go to the bathroom when I want to. And it doesn't hurt so much just to be able to pee. Being able to change someone's life with a $50 item (laughs) that everyone should have access to feels like magic. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And in my early clinical experience, uh, was in an ICU medical ICU, and I cannot tell you the numbers of times where the story of why we were taking care of somebody post-operatively from hip fracture, hip replacement yeah. was going into the bathroom. Yeah. And the numbers of times, actually it was two, it would be one elderly spouse helping another elderly mm-hmm. spouse. Mm-hmm. And both of them in trying to navigate in a small mm-hmm. space, both of them would be injured. And it would be one with a broken clavicle, a gash right. above the forehead, broken wrist, hip, you know, just multiple. I would refer to it as the million dollar hip. We right. would take care of people and spend enormous sums of money and medication and time to take care of that hip that needed to be fixed and the rehab that went along with it. But we wouldn't spend a hundred dollars on a walker or $50 right. on a raised toilet seat. Right. And when I think of how common it was coming through our emergency departments, older women with UTIs, and when yeah. you ask them about their toileting, they would say, you know, I can't get up and down. So I hold it. And it's like, ah, right. You know, so so all of these adaptations that are not healthy adaptations because we haven't fixed the environment. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's been one of your insights is changing the environment. Right. And extending your point, you know, if, if you were 90 and you needed a pacemaker, you could get it next week. But if you're 90 and you needed these small environmental changes to your house, you couldn't get them next week unless you you knew what they were and you could just get them yourself and somehow had someone train you on them. And that's because we, we don't value prevention as a society. And also there's no interest group. If you look at a procedure or a new drug or a stent or something, you can just get it through Medicare and then you prescribe it. And there's not as much prescribing of these multifaceted interventions. Those are some of the qualitative and some of the Mm -hmm. the surprise. 
What can you say about the changes in mental health, emotional well-being as a result of the Capable program? Right. So people are much more able to do what they want to be able to do. And that means they can engage in meaningful activities and the things that give them purpose in life. And so we find people who, whether they identified depression or not going into capable where they, they just have a twinkle in their eye. One quote someone said to us was, I feel more like me now. And how beautiful that they don't have to struggle with being able to get through the basic things so that they can express themselves, feed themselves, get up out of their own bed. And if you've ever been sick for a week or been down for a week or not been able to do what you want for a week, you know how depressing it is to lay around and not be able to do what you want to do. And so there's kind of an unleashing of mental and emotional energy once people are able to take care of themselves. So that's on the qualitative side. Mm -hmm. On the quantitative side, you've also been incredibly active to make the business case Mm -hmm. for why we should be offering these services. So talk through, in addition to the clinical improvements that are seeing, Mm -hmm. lifestyle improvements that we're seeing, what is the impact that this is having on cost and quality of care? Sure. So it was really important to me that we measure what it actually costs and what it actually saves rather than some kinds of things where you have to understand a formula to get it or quality adjusted life years or other things that economists sometimes talk about. I wanted just a congressional staffer with no extra knowledge to understand if it costs more than it saves or if it saves more than it costs and for insurance companies and others just to be able to look at it just adding up and seeing which side is more. And so we costed out everything of capable, including the driving time and the mileage on the car and the nurse's time and the occupational therapist time and the the parts and the labor. And we found that capable costs on average about $2,800 a person. That is for everything, the whole four months, every service. And then we found that Capable saves many more times that. So evaluators for CMS found that it saves about seven times that much to Medicare. And then we found an additional three times the savings to Medicaid. So for people who have Medicare and Medicaid, it's a 10 to one savings. And then other people who've evaluated it have also found savings across the country. So we're talking about interventions Mm -hmm. and these are all extraordinary interventions that are creating value. So when you think about capable through an innovation lens, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I I think it's a very enticing word. I also think it's a little overused, but I don't think there's another better word necessarily. I think a similar kind of definition, like generating new means to achieve predetermined goals human-centered design leads to a lot of innovation because you mentioned earlier that people are always coming up with new ways of doing something to get them <laughs> through the day. Can yeah. you speak to the, the, the growth and the adoption? How has it scaled? I'm actually working on it, being an academic, I'm working on a <laughs> paper right now about the kind of the drivers and the constrainers. In other words, like what, how has it scaled and what's led it to scale and what has constrained it from scaling. So to answer your your initial questions, people heard about it first through publishing results. First people who contacted us were Sandra Spolstra, who's in Michigan, based on the pilot results and how well the initial large trial was going. She piloted it in the Michigan Medicaid program. Michigan has a wonderfully wonderful innovations program within Medicaid. And you don't necessarily think of Medicaid as a big innovator across states, but Michigan really is. And they have a a deal where if any researcher wants to pilot an improvement to their Medicaid program, that Michigan Medicaid will match it. And she was able to pilot a version of Capable within a site of Michigan Medicaid. And then from that, she was able to get a larger grant. So that was even before we had really published the definitive trial showing that Capable worked. And then with publishing, 
you know, some really you know, thoughtful, innovative leaders of community-based organizations reached out. So for example, the National Center for Healthy Housing, they did a four-site trial of Capable in multiple different settings. So one was in a trailer park in San Diego, and one was in rural area outside of Burlington, Vermont. And so, so National Center for Healthy Housing looked at four different sites doing Capable, and they, they're they just about to publish their results and found the same result as we found, which is excellent for them. And also for us knowing that we don't just have a magical occupational therapist, or there's not just something special about Baltimore, but that this really has legs. The biggest things that constrain it are, we talked about the lack of focus on function. Most health systems function is invisible to them. They're not asking about it. They're not paid for changing it. It's not in claims data. It's difficult for most health systems to pull up, oh, what are the costs for the people who have difficulty bathing? Because no one's asking if you have difficulty, right? So once that changes, and I believe it will change, once it's not invisible in the health systems, then people will start to turn to, I'm not just capable, but other programs that focus on function. What can we do about it? It's not just, you don't just throw people away once they have functional difficulty. And in fact, if you look at homebound people and their utilization and homebound people by definition are physically constrained, they're much more likely to have an emergency room visit than a primary care visit, unfortunately. Mm. So they are using the health system, but just not in ways that they would prefer or other people would prefer. I think another thing that's really constrained the scale has been it's bringing together housing and health. And although we all, from a common sense approach, understand that housing has to do with health and health has to do with housing, it's usually separate organizations. And that's always a little harder than just writing a prescription for a pill or for a procedure. It's scaled partly because it just makes common sense. You know, you hear about it and you think, well, yeah, <laughs> I could have thought of that. And that these kinds of things, we've been talking about this compelling stories and it makes sense. And, you know, to use a business term, there's a huge market. There's so many older adults who could benefit from this. And so the places and people that have scaled it so far have a lot of that in mind of like, oh, I, you know, this would work for so-and-so and so-and-so and have kind of stories in their head of who it might work for. In terms of the numbers, when you talk about mm -hmm. the locations mm -hmm. and the organizations that have adopted you know, mm -hmm. your model. What do those numbers look like these days? So right now there's 34 sites in 18 states, but it's still serving less than 2000 people. And there's probably about 12 million older adults who could benefit from it currently. So really early days, even though just getting out of the research site is important and great. Uh, we really need Medicare to be able to cover it. And we need the Medicaid waivers in the states to cover it. And you know, until there's um, a sustainable business model for organizations to do it, it'll be constrained because right now a lot of it is from philanthropy dollars or from a health insurer kind of taking a chance and with their own money, seeing if it will work well for them. But until you can write a prescription for it or it's part of a Medicaid program, it will be just only the, the people who think far ahead and the innovators. And we need to get to where it's just um, what older adults expect that they will receive. In that business model, you mentioned that so much of this functional assessment is invisible. We're not collecting that mm -hmm. data. And I think a lot of that's tied to our business model. What are your thoughts about as we move to value-based care and there are more of the accountable care organizations? Right. It seems like this has a greater opportunity to be adopted. And then when you think about employer-based healthcare, or maybe even the VA system, truthfully. Yeah. So, so there are systems of health delivery yes. that have a business model Yes. where this is highly conducive. True? Absolutely. Yes. And in fact, the VA, they are just starting to test it in nine VA systems in Pennsylvania. And they're starting with three at first, and then the next three, and the next three, and then they're going to look across those three tiers to see how it worked. And I think the VA is a great place to scale it. You're completely right that as Medicare Advantage grows and accountable care organizations and primary care first and other value-based payments, there will be more and more incentive to do programs like Capable, but they'll need to measure and look at function and, and understand you know, how to target that. And in, currently in the annual wellness visit, 
providers ask about activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, like bathing or getting your medications, that visit is really underused. Most older adults don't get it. And also that visit is often done, but there's not a feedback loop to what should happen from it. They do it to do it and they check it off, but it doesn't feed it either into their to, it doesn't uh, translate into an activation. It exactly. doesn't translate into, right. so we've done the assessment and here's right. what we found. Right. Now, right. what is that intervention to right. uh, address right. this deficit that we found? Right, um, exactly. And how do you see that changing? I think it will change. I think that there are enough noises being made by CMS and the National Quality Forum and other places that are starting to talk about the need to look for function. So I think it's coming. I would say within the next three or four years that we'll have a more holistic system where not just are we moving towards value-based and population care, but we'll move past just recognition of social determinants of health, which are really important, to also functional determinants. My research has three streams to it. One is about aging with dignity and health in the community. One is the effects of financial strain on health and the effects of changing that financial strain. What I mean by that is not having enough income to meet one's monthly needs. And so some programs like food stamps or SNAP can change that. And so there's a lot of policy changes we can make pretty easily to uh, decrease financial strain. And then the third is structural racial discrimination and structural resilience and the impact of both on, on older adults. And that work is really just getting going. Say more about the structural resilience. What What is that all about? What are you doing? Right. So um, on the individual level, we think about resilient people, people who are good copers or their parents loved them a lot as children, or they had a special grandparent so that they are, are resilient. But just the way there's structural risk factors, we believe that there's, there's structures that impact resilience. And we published a theory in 2010 called Society to Cells uh, Resilience Framework with the idea that there's resilience on the societal level, on the community level, the family level, the whole individual level, organs and cells, and that all of those interact. So that, for example, if two adolescents have the same terrible thing happen to them, but one family really believes the child and they're in therapy and they are in a community that where it's easy to get resources and the other child, the parents don't believe them and also they're not getting enough nutrition or, you know, that, though, that the, even though it's the same act or the same, you know, violent thing, um, it could have really different effect on the child growing up over time. And so the idea of structural resilience is to look at all the levels that the individual is obviously really important and growing their self-efficacy, but also the structural factors in their life are, were there good community college opportunities nearby? Is there green space? There's more and more evidence that green space impacts all kinds of things, even cognition. Was there a boys and girls club? What were some of the, again, the structural factors that made them be able to graduate from high school or graduate from college or get them on a good footing? In many communities, those structures are underground in a way, and then other ones, it's, it's straight out, you know, you could do a Google search and find them. And so we are just in the planning phases of interviewing older adults in five different cities across the country, Minneapolis, LA, New Orleans, some New York and Baltimore, to take them through kind of a journey map of their life with the milestones that they have achieved and understand some of the structural things that help them gain each one. And so that's just a start. In in the second strain that you were talking about as far as financial yeah. um, well-being and the difference between the financial strain, the income needs, can you spend some time on what we are learning and better understanding yes. in that domain of work that you're doing. Thank you. Yes. So financial strain is very important and it seems to actually even be physiologically important that people who have not enough money or just enough money for each month have higher inflammatory burden like interleukin-6 and CRP. And also my dear colleague, Laura Samuel has published about that people's inflammatory burden was actually different based on when they had received a social security check 
back in their account if they were financially strained. And if they weren't, if you have plenty of money, who cares when the money hits your account? But if you're watching every penny, um, she found really physiologic differences based on whether the check had hit their account yet. Um, we've also together, Laura and I have done work uh, looking at food stamps called SNAP and risk for hospitalization and nursing home admission. And we've found that even controlling for, for the amount of income that getting SNAP matters in terms of a decreased risk for hospitalization or nursing home admission, and so does the actual dose. So for example, $100 a month is more protective than $50 a month. And the great thing about SNAP is it's an entitlement and it's really underused. Um, less than 50% of older adults who are eligible for SNAP get it. If we could figure out how to have people sign up for it more, that in itself could help reduce hospitalization of older adults. I think that that fits in when you have said, you know, small things make big right. differences in older people's lives. Right. Other examples of where small things, where innovation and rethinking things might make a difference? Just a mesh net under someone's mail slot makes them not have to reach down to the floor to get it. And we've known people who've been missing healthcare appointments and the doctor or nurses didn't know why. It turned out they just had a mail pile on their floor because they couldn't reach the mail, you know, like so very, very simple. Or, you know, a, a crock pot for someone who can't chew very well. Or like, I, I go immediately to the practical, those kinds of very small things. But I think you were asking a, a larger question. So the Social Security Administration knows how much people receive from Social Security, and they could pretty much know who would be eligible for SNAP. And kind of with a stroke of a pen, they could make sure that those people can get SNAP and that, that it's an opt out instead of opt in so that people would naturally get it. That would be a very small but monumental thing. Nurse scientist and health innovator Sarah Zanton teaches and researches at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing in Baltimore, Maryland where she is the Health Equity and Social Justice Endowed Professor, the Director of Center on Innovative Care and Aging, and holds a joint appointment with the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In these roles, she studies and addresses the health disparities in older adults, working to eliminate the quality of life differences for seniors across socioeconomic and racial lines. The goal of Sarah's work is assisting seniors to age with dignity and equity, and for the world to understand older adults are a gift, not a burden. While the designation isn't listed on her CV, she's an incredible public intellect, a wise philosopher, and an absolute national treasure. Early in her career, Sarah observed that the challenges her clients faced caring for themselves and moving around their homes were impacting their overall mental and physical health as much and maybe even more than their medical needs and were often a determining factor in their ability to age where and how they hoped. In response, together with colleagues, Sarah developed Capable, the Community Aging in Place, Advancing Better Living for Elders program, working from the foundational belief that home is where help is. Capable programs have been established in 28 locations in 14 states, and recently a key committee housed within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services unanimously recommended that Capable be voted for consideration as a program covered by Medicare. Across the globe, the needs of many older adults in the last several years of life are often poorly met. And as a result, this period of life can be incredibly stressful, expensive, and dispiriting for everyone touching the life of that older adult. Remaining independent at home and active in the community, not burdening loved ones financially and physically, and having their wishes for care honored are top priorities for older adults. Sarah's work, along with others, reveals just how many older adults might benefit from such simple, low-cost home modifications. One estimate recently published in JAMA's Internal Medicine Journal suggested 12 million people over 65 living in their own homes 
could use equipment to help them safely manage bathing and toileting, two of the activities older people most commonly struggle with. Yet over half of these people who need these items don't have them, don't have access to them, or don't have the ability to install them. And as Sarah said, being able to change someone's life with a $50 item that everyone should have access to, it feels like magic. And as Sarah explains, you know, we don't think about this, but our last decades of life are a time with a lot of change. That as we age, our health and function trajectories really widen and that aging is not monolithic. While a significant number of older adults do experience frailty and progressive functional decline, some older adults make their greatest gains and contributions in their latest years. As we celebrate older Americans, Sarah reminds us, small things make big differences in the lives and functions of an older person, like a hand railing, moving the microwave to a lower level, a raised toilet seat, or a policy decision like making an entitlement benefit like SNAP, an opt-out choice instead of having to apply for it. Everyone wants to have control in their lives, and that doesn't change as we grow older. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at cunowpodcast.com.